Hey there. Happy Saturday, happy streaming, and welcome to Carl 24K Data Science. I guess that's where you are. <laughs> that's my stream. My name's Carl, and I'm I am a data scientist. Um, streaming to you from Silicon Valley, California. So please let me know where you're from and uh, what your relationship to the data is, to the data lifestyle, professional or aspiring. It's all good here. Let's see. Let me get into the stream. Um, if you haven't seen my streams before, I usually start out with a bunch of introductory talking. Uh, kind of just explaining the background for the area that I'm working in and then later on in the stream I'll start doing some actual live coding um, But please let me know if the sounds okay uh, if the volumes okay. I After watching my last stream. I found out that I had horrible um, Keyboard noise in the last stream and no one said anything uh, so thank you for everyone who, who, who still watched that stream. When I was watching the replay, it was actually painful. So I really apologize for the typing noise. It was noob me, you know, first stream with a new mic. I didn't realize that it would pick up the keyboard so loud. So hopefully the experience will be better this time. Uh, always trying to do more of a professional job as a streamer, even though it's obviously <laughs> just a hobby for me, just for fun. But anyway. Let me start explaining the stuff I got to explain for anyone who happens to be new and apologies to the people who have uh, heard this all before, but I got to explain what is churn because I talk a lot about churn here. Churn is when your customers, uh, subscribers or followers, they quit or uncancel or cancel <laughs> or unfollow you, whatever, what you don't want to happen. You don't want people to churn. No one does. Um, so there's this metric called the churn rate, which is the origin of that term. And that is the percentage of customers that drop out in a month or a year. Um, I do do churn rate calculations. We're not going to do any today. It's kind of not, it's a technical thing. It's important. Not the most exciting thing. Uh, more of analytics than I'd say data science, if you want to get technical about it. Anyway, churn is also a verb. You can say, I'm churning from uh, Hulu, because I, you know, or Netflix, because I watched the last season of Cobra Kai and I'm done with Netflix for a while, I'm churning. Or you can say the customer churned. And you can also say, make it a noun and say, make a churn report or make a report of last quarter's churns. Or even you can say, that customer is a churn. They canceled their contract last week, you know. But that's if you're a real hardcore uh, subscription world person, you might use, you might say that. What is fighting churn with data? Real quick, got to make a plug for myself. Uh, this is the book that I wrote about churn. It's based on my experience when I was the chief data scientist at a company called Zwora, which had a lot of subscription companies using their platform. So that's how I became like a churn expert. And I became a data science guy. Well, I go way back. How did I get started in data science? Uh, I did a PhD that included a lot of machine learning uh, back before it was cool, basically. So I go way back with machine learning and churn is just one application of that. Anyway, so book right here and there's a discount code if you're actually going to buy it from my publisher, you know, do use that discount code, save a bit of money. But what is fighting churn with data really means data driven churn reduction. Uh, and that means using data, hey, on point 007, what's up? And what's up uh, too? How's it going? Happy Saturday. Are you into programming or data? Or do you know about churn already? So the best way to not have your customers churn is to make a great product with features and content that they love. So that is obvious, but you can use your data to make your product better by analyzing what people do or don't do. And we'll look a little bit of that in this stream, you know, uh, what kind of data you analyze. We won't exactly do a, a churn analysis like that. But you also use your data to do marketing. So you want to 
make marketing campaigns that target people and really give them useful information, again, using data to figure out what they want. You also do what's called customer success and support, which means helping out customers in need. And you can use data like churn forecasting, which we're going to do later in the stream, to figure out what customers need. 1.007, you got into data and programming. Uh-oh, first month. Ooh, okay, well, welcome. Hope you learned something interesting by hanging out here. Do my best. Give you support and advice along the way. Um, let's see. Oh, and lastly, for data-driven churn reduction, you might adjust your pricing plan, your sales, to uh, basically change the price that customers pay so that they get a good value, but you know, you don't give out discounts. Because many people think you want to give out discounts to fight churn, but that's actually not a good way to fight churn. Actually, what you want to do is make a pricing structure that has different levels where pe people can get a value on your product no matter you know what their level of use is. So that's data-driven churn reduction, and that's what fighting churn with data really means. Uh, it's, and it just, apart from being the cute title for my book, or I hope it's cute. I think it's cute. Maybe no one else does, but anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> Why learn about churn? I'll just make a quick plug. Uh, it's the most common data science problem in the world because every company today has a churn problem. All companies want recurring revenue now. It's like the new gold, recurring revenue. So all companies have churn problems, um, but there's some special techniques, you know, that you that you need for churn. And I go over that in the book. Today it's going to be more general data science, but this is also a great way to learn data science foundations because I go at it from raw data all the way to results and action. So I don't know. I think it's a good way to learn. All right, this next phase, very briefly, I need to give out some thank yous. First thank you is going out to Arin Basu1. Thank you for following. I hope you'll see this uh, message when you watch this stream later. Next thank you for one replay replay mini feed work. Norbert707, thank you for following. Yes. Don't worry, I don't have too many new followers. I'm not like so popular. I'm not gonna go through like dozens and dozens of people, but I gotta give a shout out to everyone who actually followed. Maybe some of you are watching uh, right now. Suravitauska, thank you for following. Suravitauska, someone can help me with the pronunciation. Uh, happy to hear how that is said, but thank you for following. Suravituska and Simon1066, thank you for following. Oh, wait a second. On point 007, you're next. I see. It's not kidding. And you're actually here. So glad this is going out to someone as soon as the replay works. Come on, replay. On point 007, thank you for following. And you were here just a minute ago. So you actually know. Hmm, one of your obstacles is the specific math you need for data. What kind of math comes up frequently? And do you need it at all? Uh-oh, I'm crashing. Oh, I was kind of crashing for a second there. Uh, so sorry, the question about what kind of math comes up frequently and do you need it? Well, some math that comes up frequently is probability and statistics. Um, and you kind of do need to know your way around probability and statistics to do a lot with data. Um, and the other kind of math you need a little bit less is uh, linear algebra, which is kind of like matrices and vectors. That, I don't know, you used to need it more, but nowadays probably not so much. So you don't need a lot of math, I think, but there is a little bit. You know, you've got to know some, of course, algebra you know, some addition and division. But you don't need a ton of math unless you're really doing like research on new algorithms. So anyway, on point 007, hope that answers your question. And again, wait, I'll just give you one more thank you for following because you're actually here to see it. And I've got one more thank you coming up. Last thank you is for any moment now, mini feed replay, it's always a delayed reaction. Alongubukin, 
Alongu Kin. Uh, that's my best pronunciation. But thank you for following if you're out there. Very glad to uh, have you joining with me. All right, boy, enough talking. This is where I say, whoops, too far. I wanna say, where's the data? And start by showing everyone the data that I'm gonna be working with. And I'll do that by starting with a database, actually. So we're gonna be analyzing churn. And so there are, in the database, I already have a query prepped here. There's uh, subscriptions. So we have subscribers. The product is called Social Net. So it's actually a simulation. It's not a real social network, but it's a simulated social network. And you can see that we have subscriptions. Each subscription is for an account shown in the second column. Uh, they're all the same price, so this isn't that realistic. It's a, it's a simulation because it's hard to get real data to analyze for churn because it's proprietary for every company. So this is a simulation that I use to make the data we're going to analyze. But it's very realistic, as you'll see. So you can see there's multiple simulations and su subscriptions for a person. Uh, they're what we call co-terminal. So the next subscription starts when the last one ends and each one represents a period for that customer. Uh, and they churn when their subscriptions end. Now, who are these customers? We have an account table also, which tells us a little bit about these customers. Um, they have a channel, which is where they use the social network, a date of birth, and a country. Now, don't worry, this is all simulated data. So no real personal information was used to make this stream. Scout's honor, this is all simulated data. No real PII was used anywhere uh, for anything. But so this is the account data we have. Um, now, the more interesting data that we really use for analyzing churn is events. Uh, now, this is not very interesting because... Um, Hey, Ken Perfu, wow, haven't seen you for a while. Welcome, hope you're doing well. I'm going over the event data for people who haven't seen it before. Ooh, my computer's kind of crashing. That is not cool, what's happening here? Getting the spinny thing. Which language do I use? You usually go with Python, R sometimes. Yep, I use Python. Um, and I used a lot of R also. So the truth about all this churn code, I'm going to do a lot of Python later in the stream, but I originally did all these analyses in R, and then when I wrote my book, I translated it to Python. So. Oh, cool. You, Kenneth Pafu, you started a programming boot, com, boot camp, and it's a ton of work. Ooh. Okay, well, thanks for making the time to hang out with me here. I'll try to get onto some new programming real quick. I just got to go uh, through the basic data background. Uh, I think this is it. Let's see. I'm trying to show the events. Oops, I guess this so is So this is showing that the events actually mean something you can see that they are things like posts and unfriends and messages. I joined on an event type table to show that, you know, these are, well, what the unnormalized value of the events actually means. So simple query here, but we're doing all the churn analysis from events like these, which show us what the customers did while they were using the service. So this is showing that this is a social network where people can send messages and replies and posts and stuff. On point 007, so we analyze the simulated data using events. Yes, that's right. Where do we get the simulated data from? Aha, I have an answer for that, which is, well, you can set it up uh, by getting this code from my repo on GitHub. You can also install it from a package. You can pip install fight churn, and that will show you, um, that'll give you the basics. Uh, it won't have the code that I'm working on on this stream, because on this stream I'm working in this branch, whoops, oh, go back. I'm working in this branch, which is, I, I started with a date and then it's transformers. So this is the branch. Um, you can get it from my GitHub repo. You have to install Postgres and Python. Um, to do all this, because that's just what I'm using. And you probably have Python already. Not everyone has Postgres though, so I don't know. It's the database I was using when I wrote the book, so kind of stuck with it for now. I keep thinking of trying to switch to a more common database, but someday, someday. 
Anyway, so you run a data simulation that comes with the, the repo. And that's how you'll get all that data populated into your own Postgres database. So it'll be like your own version of the simulation. So, so that's where the data comes from and the setup. Um, now let's see. So in previous streams, I've already made a data set uh, from this data. And this is showing a summary of the data set. Um, there's a column for churn in the data set. I generally like to keep my outcome in the same data as the rest of the data set. At least for the book I did that. So this is the outcome column that we're trying to predict when we're doing like machine learning is the is churn column. Um, so it's 5% uh, churn rate and then there are all these other metrics based off the events in the data set. Uh, like per month, new friend per month, post per month, ad view per month. These are all the different metrics that are calculated and that's part of the data engineering process that I've really, I've gone over that in future streams. At a, I mean, I've gone over it in past streams. Boy, I'm getting my times mixed up. I've gone over it in past streams and I'll go over it again in a future stream. We're not gonna do too much about that in today's stream. Here we're just kind of assuming that the data is already there. Um, but I'll get into some more code now by showing how we make this data set overview. Oh, on point 007, you already have Postgre, Postgre SQL. Do I use Jupyter Notebook or Google Colab or PyCharm? The last. I am more of a uh, an IDE guy than a notebook guy. I just, I mean, it's more professional, really, to write code that can be reused. I know everyone does their analyses. Whoops in a notebook. So actually, let's go straight to PyCharm since you brought it up. Um, let, I'm going to do as a quick intro to the coding and the coding environment, I'm going to do the code that creates that table of statistics that we just looked at. Um, and it'll kind of set the stage for some of the more advanced programming that I'll do in a few minutes. So let's see, I want to... This is the listing 5.2, that means chapter five, listing two, because it's all referencing to that book. And this is PyCharm, uh, which you probably recognize if you used it before. I want to run this churn stats. As usual, I have too many things configured in here. And I didn't prepare it. <laughs> I didn't prepare this, which I should have, so I apologize. Let me look in let me look in here at all my configurations. And hopefully I'll find the one that will run the, here it is, run stats. Okay, and I'm just making sure chapter five listing to and it's doing a later version, but that's fine. Okay, so here's an example of running the code to calculate those statistics. Let's see. So at the first break point. Uh, first, we pass in a, a file path, which is where the data set is located. Um, yep, you use PyCharm too. Um, I do pandas and matplotlib all in PyCharm also. Um, and I, I don't, yeah, it's, it's complicated. You know, I save out a lot of results instead of looking at them in a notebook. Um, and that's kind of a habit just because I'm more of a programmer. You know, I like my code organized into functions and modules. But anyway, you can do that in a notebook, but it's a little bit harder. So this is where I read in the data set. And this is actually, we can take a quick look and show you what the data set looks like. So each observation is identified by a date and account ID. And the columns are those metrics that I was talking about before. Like per month, new friend per month, post per month, etc. I guess there's more over there somewhere if I scroll over. Um, so that's the data set. And to calculate in this exercise, I'm just going to real quick calculate a table of statistics, um, which is going to set the stage for some stuff we do later. So the first part of making statistics is the pandas function describe. It's actually most of most of it. Just running that one function is actually most of what I have in my summary table. And I flip it to the transpose. Whoops. I want to show you the summary. So de describe is a great pandas function if you don't know it. Um, it gives you the count, the mean, the standard deviation, the min, max, and the quartiles. And I just like to add a few additional statistics to that summary, um, which is 
the skew, and the kurtosis. Now on point 007, if you're still out there, this is the kind of math it actually helps to know like what these terms mean um, because it's just important to be able to explain your data using these kinds of statistics and percentiles. So. Coffee refill there. Anyway, so I take a few additional percentiles and the percentage that's non-zero, uh, and then I save that out into a file. Now, many people, if you were using a notebook, you would just print out this table in your notebook, and you'd be like, there it is, there's my, sum there's my summary. I like to save it to a file, um, because then I have it, and you can, I can show you in my folder here, this is the summary that I just created um, by running the program, created today at 2.20. And I like saving out these kinds of results outside of a notebook just because then I can look at them whenever I want without having a notebook open. Um, if you work with business people, you can also format them, you know, like if I want to make this, you know, you can do stuff like, oh, I need to give this to the marketing department. So I'm going to, you know, format it nicely, you know, now it's like ready to show to the marketing department practically <laughs> anyway hmm, so your statistics need a bit more work than you thought well I hope it's not too much but that's only if you're gonna get really into data analysis um, but you do need it for machine learning too because it just helps to be able to look at those kinds of stats to understand your data uh, it you know help you pick the best algorithm stuff like that but you don't need to be super deep in it that, that I'll say but anyway, this is an example of a short listing, and this was this is a summary of the data set that we're using. It's got 16 metrics, um, but so let me get back to what I was supposed to be. Um, yeah, I open it up in an Excel file, well, or any any whatever you have your default CSV file opener could be Google Sheets or um, you know Open Office, um, but. Yep, yep, that's how I like to look at data. It's more convenient in that kind of format. Now, I'm gonna start talking about what I'm doing that's actually new today. Or, well, it's not super new because I'm gonna start by reviewing what I did in the past streams. And then we're gonna get into new stuff. But this is the real subject of the stream, which is transformers. Um, and if you missed my previous streams, are you new to this? A transformer is an object which represents or implements a data pipeline transformation. And I'll say about more and give real examples in just a minute. So this is in scikit-learn, and scikit-learn provides some basic transformers that you can use. Um, standard at things like normalizing the data and uh, principal component analysis dimension reduction is what you can do. And I have similar versions of those kinds of operations. Um, th those are two examples of scaling data um, to scores or normalized versions. And also dimension reducing data are two examples of the types of things you would do with a transform or a transformer. Um, and I also do those in fighting turn data, or I do those for all my churn analyses. Um, I don't really use the, the sklearn standard transforms for this though. I have to I hate to say I have my own versions, my own preference for how to do that. So what I did in the last couple of streams is I took my algorithms and wrote them as sklearn transformers. So this is what we're going to go over next. First we're going to go over the transformers that I already wrote, and then later in the stream we're going to go over putting them together in a pipeline. So that's the plan. So this is the transformer pattern. Um, you have a heck ton of imports, <laughs> I guess. That's not really part of the pattern, but there are a heck ton of imports. Um, and then in any transformer, you have an init, of course, like any object, and that's where you can pass in arguments. And then there's a fit function where you are given some data and you do whatever you have to do to make your transformer work from the data. Um, and then there's a transform function, which is actually where you do something to the data, either convert it to a score or, you know, dimension reduce it. So this is the pattern. 
And the first thing we're gonna talk about putting into this, this pattern, uh-oh, I'm having some video freezes. I hope it's working for everyone who's watching. My video keeps freezing in Streamlabs OBS and it comes back again. So I'm just gonna ignore this and keep streaming. So tell me if like it's not working. I don't know. Wow, now I'm losing control. Why am I freezing? Wow, stream, getting no love from Streamlabs OBS here. Having a major issue, a meltdown. I don't know. I think I'm still live, but my whole Streamlabs OBS has frozen up and I've lost control of my computer. This sucks. <laughs> Trying to get control of my computer again. Whoa! What the fuck? Whoa. Alright. I think I'm back. Hope some people hope it's still working. All right, my computer kind of came back. I quit Microsoft Excel. That is often the root of problems during streaming is trying to use Microsoft Excel. So I quit Microsoft Excel. So maybe it wasn't such a good idea. Okay, on point oh seven, it's late here. Where are you didn't you hear where you're from? But sorry, you got to go. Um, and I hope you join me again. Thanks for following. Um, and sorry that my I was just like crashing there for a minute. I blame Microsoft Excel, seriously, but I'm back to normal now. <laughs> so anyway, on point 007, hope I see you again. So I'm now about to talk about the concept of scoring um, or normalizing data, which is that normally your data observations are all bunched up and then you have a few extreme outliers. That's one of the problems of data analysis. Um, and when you score your data or normalize it, it has nice properties like being zero mean and one standard deviation. Um, and it's distributed more evenly. So the, the bunching up is distributed across the range. So how do we accomplish that? Um, not with a standard normalization because standard normalization does nothing to help s spread out your data more evenly. So I use what I'm calling my extreme value scoring formula. Um, it's also called like hyperbolic sign or some kind of transform like that. Um, so you have a base metric, uh, which is uh, M, and you actually, well, the basic scoring transform that I teach is using the logarithm. Uh, this is the, the simpler transform. You take the logarithm of one plus your metric and that smooths out uh, clumps together data. And then you take um, the score is that transform metric minus the mean uh, divided by the standard deviation. And then the more advanced form of the transform is to take the logarithm of this formula, which is like that hyperbolic transform thing. I don't even remember exactly what it is, but it's the metric plus the square root of the metric squared plus one. And this works for negative values. Um, so that's like the scoring transform that I like to use. You take this logarithmic formula and then you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. Um, and it's much better for highly skewed metrics or metrics with a lot of extreme values. Because if you go back, actually, I can go back and show you. If you look at this, this data has extreme values and real customer data tends to. Um, the typical number of likes per month is 90, but the maximum is like 2000. It could be a bot or something like that. Um, so the skew is seven, which is very high, and the kurtosis is 67, which is really high. So this is extremely skewed data. But it's realistic, actually. I mean, real customer data tends to be like that. Um, so that's why we use this formula in the transform. And now I will dive into the code for actually implementing that scoring formula in a transformer. Let's see. Hopefully my computer will stop freaking out. 
Uh, let's see. So I'm done with the data set stats. Let's close this one up. We want to do the transformer. So let's see. This is it. I already wrote this code in a previous stream, but we'll, we can take a quick look before I run it. So this is the uh, transformer algorithm. Well, I should probably keep that breakpoint. <laughs> I'm going to want that in a minute. So it's got an init, a fit, and a transform, just like the pattern I showed previously. And this is a little script. This is the, the function I run to actually you know, use the transformer. And I'll put this breakpoint here. Uh, so right after we load the data and before I pass it into the transformer. And let's see, now I want to run, 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 score transformer. This is, this must be it. Okay. Okay, so now we'll see that algorithm in action and also the use of a transformer. So let's see. Uh, is that where, yeah, that's the breakpoint where I just was, right? Right. Or no, 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 this is the wrong one. I am in... I want to... This is regular score transformer. I want to do extreme score transformer. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> wrong, wrong one. Let me close that. There is the original version and then the extreme version. And, you know, we got to be extreme, right? This is, this is extreme data science. <laughs> Not really. All right. So here's where I'm actually creating the transformer. Um, the only argument is a skew threshold. So this constructor is pretty simple. Well, it does, there are these um, arguments with defaults, which is a kurtosis threshold and an outcome column. Um, because the churn data all includes an outcome column, which I'm working around. Uh, and this just sets a bunch of default variables that we're going to need later. So that's the constructor for the transformer. Not much going on. The next part is the fit function, which is going to use some of the statistics. Let's see. Is it different from Bach Cox or Gren Johnson transform? I'm actually not sure about that, PowerB. Uh, Bach, Cox, or Geo Johnson transform. Yeah, the truth is I'm a I'm like a practicing data scientist, but I'm not like a statistics master. So maybe if you can tell me what those transforms are, then I could uh, help tell you how it compares, and we can figure it out together. How, how about that for a deal? But so here is now the fit function uh, on this transformer. Um, First, if there is an outcome column, it basically drops it from the measurement data. And the first thing it does is it checks the columns that were in the data. And this is important so that later on when we pass in new data, we can see, make sure that it has the same columns or the same schema. Now this is similar to the statistics I was doing in the example before where I'm taking the minimums, the skews, and the kurtosis of all of the columns. So this, if you look at this variable, this is now a series, uh, which is named. It's a named series for the minimums on all the values, which happen to be all zero or just negative one in one case. But we need that later. Um, and this, this is basically figuring out which columns are skewed. Those where the skews are greater than the skew thresholds. And the, the fat tailed columns are those which have extreme values that are not just uh, positive. That's like a, a term from finance. Um, so this is checking the columns that are going to get those transforms, the log transform and the hyperbolic transform, whatever you call it, a hyperbolic sign transform, I think. It's in my book, actually. You can look it up. I, I figured out what transform it really was when I wrote the book, but I forgot. Okay, so that is gathering statistics that we need. Um, let's see. The next thing I'm doing is dropping the outcome column. Uh, right, because now I'm going to actually transform the data. Well, this is, these are the columns that are going to get the skewed transform. I'm going to do that log of 1 plus the, the, the metric is now the new value. And this is happening for several columns, as you can see as I scroll through. Post per month, 
add view per month, dislike per month. There's a lot of columns that are skewed in a way that can use that transform. I'm actually going to put a breakpoint here and just go to it. This next transform we only use for the extreme value columns that also have negative values in them. Um, and that's just one column, I believe. Yep. Or maybe two. Or maybe how many? All right, it was a few. <laughs> um, and then lastly, I calculate the means and the standard deviations of the transformed data. Or, well, all the data, including the columns that were transformed. And that is actually the fitting part of this fit method. Um, so if I look now at my churn data transformer, I have in it these values showing me what are the means of all the columns, like my mean vector. So it has a bunch of the statistics that I had previously you know, showed how to calculate. Um, and we also know which columns are skewed and which columns had extreme values. So. That is what happens in the fit. Now in the transform, this is the next part of the transformer pattern, actually transforming with, the, I'm gonna pass in the data again. Now this is actually the same data, I'm passing it in to transform it. But we're gonna use new data later. Um, here in the transform function, first you make a copy, and if there's an outcome column, drop it. This is an important check because this checks that all the columns in the new data are in the columns of the transformer. Um, and this and it works, so that's important. This is a little list comprehension here to loop over the columns, um, if that made sense. And then I actually reorder the columns in the data to be the same as the list in the transformer, and that's important because now we're going to, well, in a minute, we're going to subtract the means and divide by the standard deviations. So next is applying the log transforms to the, the indicated columns. And we're using the columns that we determined when we did the fitting. That's like the key to doing the transformer. And then lastly, subtract the means and divide by the standard deviations. Uh, which is, this is the, the, the normal normalization or the standard normalizations that people do uh, without all the log transforms. So, um, lastly, if there is an outcome column, we have to add it back into the transform data. And that's what happens here. So that's it. Now I've applied the transform function um, and I have a scored version of the data. So here are the last things I do in this listing are save the results and also save the transformer uh, in a pickle. Except I think I decided, you know, in an earlier stream that I'm not going to use the fat tail terminology. I'm just gonna call it an extreme value transformer or extreme transformer for short. I don't know, the whole, the fat tails is, a, is a, a term from, you know, statistics where they talk about distributional properties, but I just think it sounds weird, you know? So I'm gonna, I'm kind of canceling that term from my own code base. <laughs> and now I'm just calling it the extreme transformer. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about canceling a statistical term. But anyway, so that is the transformer, the score transformer uh, demonstrated. And now let's go back to the talk track and talk about the next kind of transformer, which is dimension reduction with a loading matrix. I'll give a brief review of this, uh, and then I will show how to do it in a, in a transformer. So, this is a little toy data set here with five accounts and, whoops, with five accounts and six metrics. And we're going to group the first three metrics uh, into one by averaging them and group the second, the, the fourth and f the fifth metrics into one also by averaging them. And you do that average by multiplying with what's called a loading matrix. 
I'm kind of showing the multiplication in a wonky way here, but this is meant to rep be a, a simple representation of a matrix multiplication, which if on point 007 is still here, this is an example of some of the math that you need. Why is my sound not working? I can't really tell what's going on with this right now. I'm not getting... I'm not getting any of my sound levels. I'm just doing a quick sound check on my monitor here. All right. The sound seems to be okay, even though Streamlabs OBS is really fucking with me and has stopped giving me the working levels, so I hope if anyone's out there you can hear me still talking. Just let me know if the sound goes or the music goes dead. But oh, technical issues, technical issues. So anyway, what was I saying? So this is an example of a simple loading matrix where we're averaging, we have entries to average the first three ma metrics together into one, and then average the next two metrics together into another. And then lastly, add, you know, keep this final matrix the same. And you do it actually with matrix multiplication. And I'm kind of showing the loading matrix sideways, actually. So, that is a toy problem of a loading matrix. This is an example of a real loading matrix from a larger, or not really large, but a more normal sized data set. You know, one with maybe 50 metrics. This is actually cut off because there's more metrics. But this is showing the correlation matrix for a real data set from a company called Clipfolio. Um, and Clipfolia, and it shows how many metrics can be correlated, because this is a, a correlation matrix, is what it's demonstrating. Um, and those, the metrics that are highly correlated are those that get grouped together. And so that's kind of the idea of the, um, of the loading matrix. Okay. So this is an example of a real loading matrix. And let's go forward and talk about how do you find the groups that are gonna be in a loading matrix. We use an algorithm called hierarchical clustering um, or agglomerative uh, clustering. Those are different terms for it. Um, and you use metric scores, which is convenient because we've just been calculating metric scores. Um, and you work in an iterative process of identifying the two most correlated metrics, merge those two metrics together, um, and replace them with an average. And then you recalculate the correlation matrix and find the next two most correlated matrix. And you keep doing that repeatedly until um, you have no more metrics left. And that's basically the clustering algorithm or hierarchical clustering. I have a more detailed explanation in my previous stream, but I'm gonna skip it for now because um, I have done it in a past stream. So next we're going to look at the metric grouping transformer, um, which uses, as I described, the correlation to calculate a loading matrix. So let's go to that listing now. Let's see. Should be somewhere. Yeah, metric group transformer. See, I already have it. Because I just did this in my last stream. Let's see. Once again, the transformer pattern is an init method. Um, and then there's a fit and a transform. And in this case, I've got some helper functions because uh, this transformer was actually more complicated. Because of the reason I went away. 
If anyone's out there listening, let me know how the sound is because I've completely lost my monitor. Streamlabs OBS is not being kind to me today. So let's run this and see how the this algorithm works. Um, as usual, we have a breakpoint set. So I will start this. Now note that in this case, I'm assuming that I'm passing in um, scores, or I'm loading scores. Like I, se I set a data set path, and then I load the scores that I previously saved. Um, and then this is creating the, the transformer. There's a few parameters. One it is a correlation threshold that's used for the clustering. Uh, so save that parameter. Also convert it to a dissimilarity threshold by subtracting it from one. Um, and there is an outcome column. And then these, uh, these are just variables that are, are set to none for later. All right, so that's the constructor. Now in the fit function, um, we basically take the data we're gonna, that we've got and drop the outcome because we're not gonna use that. This checks the columns that are in the data. That's standard operation. Uh, and now I actually calculate the correlation matrix uh, from the data. We can actually look at that, it's pretty cool. So this function core in pandas gives me a correlation matrix. And we can see it right here. Um, so you can see there's moderate to high correlations between some of these, um, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, kind of correlations, that's reasonably high. The diagonal, of course, has one correlation. Here's an even stronger correlation, 0.9 between message per month and reply per month. Uh, and then the rest of these correlations are lower. So this kind of gives you a sense of what metrics are gonna get grouped when we run the clustering algorithm. So let's see. So let's see, oh shoot, I did, that was the whole algorithm, oh damn it. I'm supposed to step through that function. <laughs> Let me stop and do that over. This one, find correlation clusters. That's like where the magic really happens. So we better step through that one. <laughs> Let me go to the next breakpoint. All right, here we are. Find correlation clusters. This is actually where the clustering happens. So we better uh, go through that one. Okay, so first we take, we take the correlation matrix that we calculated and we we use we consider that a similarity met matrix, a similarity measurement. And we actually the algorithm we're going to use wants dissimilarity. So subtracting correlation from one makes it into dissimilarity measure. Um, so that wherever the correlation was highest, now the dissimilarity will be the lowest. And wherever the correlation was lowest, they were dissimilar dissimilar before now that'll be that'll become the highest values after subtracting it now these two functions actually perform the clustering linkage and f cluster which are from um scipy scipy cluster and sci uh oh well, yeah really just scipy cluster and that actually performs the whole hierarchical clustering algorithm which i explained to you uh briefly before uh, let's see, wait, where am I? Here I am. So this actually kind of kind of does the clustering in one swoop. You don't actually get to see the algorithm. I guess we could have stepped into that to see it, but it's kind of like, you know, more details than necessary. Which is an example of math that you don't need to know, because there's so many math done for you in packages out there. A lot of math you don't need to know. Um, and then this labels actually takes the results of the hierarchy. The hierarchy kind of forms the grouping of the metrics and sees who is most similar or dissimilar. And then you pass in a threshold to cluster, which will actually label them into clusters. So these labels are now the cluster assignment. So you can see here, to read this, um, so metrics zero, two, and three are in cluster one. Metric one is in cluster two. Uh, and this kind of shows you uh, six and seven are in cluster nine. But 
This is like a, a numeric form of the output, but it's actually not super useful because uh, it's hard to interpret. You're like, well, what are the groups that those metrics are in? And where's my loading matrix, which is what we need to reduce the data. So that's what the rest of this code does. Um, this function, I'm going to step over it. It actually turns those labels into um, the the actual clusters or into a more usable version of it. So now I've labeled the columns, my original metrics by their clusters. So I can see add view per month, like per month, post per month are all going to be in the first group. Unfriend per month is the second group. Uh, two unfriend related metrics. Messages and replies is the next group, group index two. Uh, and the rest of these don't get grouped. So I've basically turned the labels uh, those numeric labels into a more usable result. And then lastly, in this function, um, I create the loading matrix given that data. Um, and it's basically like a loop. You know, I basically make the loading matrix as a, as a, a matrix of zeros. And then I just loop over reading that labeled column data frame and writing in to the loading matrix. Well, you put ones on the di diagonals and a fraction for the averaging um, in the off diagonals. And then this all just resorts it. Let's see. I'm not sure it's really worth stepping through this. Um, I think I should just step out of this function if no one's complaining. And we can look at the load the loading matrix right here. So this shows the loading matrix that was just created. And this shows the real loading matrix for this data. Uh, and so the first few metrics all, all get entries that will average them into one. And these next metric metrics also get entries to average them. And then the, the rest of the loading matrix is ones, indicating that these metrics don't get grouped together. So sorry if this explanation was all kind of quick, but I did go over it in deta more detail in the last stream. So this is kind of just like reviewing uh, how the dimension reduction works. But that's actually the end of the fit method. And at this point, my transformer um, now has a loading matrix embedded into it um, in this variable, right? It also has, you know, these other things that it used along the way, but you know, that's kind of it. So now we can see, watch how to actually transform the data. Let's see. So I've got the data to fit and as usual, I'm going to drop the outcome and I'll put it back on later. Here I am going to, this line ensures that the data is in the same order of columns as the loading matrix, uh, which is important. And I also convert it to a NumPy array because on this row, I actually do a matrix multiplication between the loading matrix and the data to group. And that's actually what does the dimension reduction. Um, because the number of resulting rows in the, the number of resulting columns in the data set is the number of rows in the loading matrix. So the original data, ND array to group, uh, had, was, had 1243 by 16, so 16 columns. And then the grouped version only has 12 columns. So that's the effect of the dimension reduction. Um, you might say that it's not really worth it to run dimension reduction when you only have 16 columns, and you would probably be right about that. Um, this is sort of a toy problem just to demonstrate the concept um, of doing this. It's really more effective, like I said, it's more important. Um, like I said in the slide deck here, in a real data set, you probably might have 50, 100, maybe even more metrics, and a lot of them are going to tend to be correlated. And that can be, well, it's not beneficial for certain algorithms, uh, particularly regression, which we're going to go through later. It also makes it really hard to interpret, and it can help your users a lot if you can tell them what metrics are related. And when you're scoring customers for segmentation, you can group together related metrics uh, to give them average scores. Whoops. Okay. Actually, I was still supposed to be finishing this demonstration, right? We never really finished the demonstration. Um, I basically just showed you doing the, mul the matrix multiplication, then I started talking about how it's a toy problem. 
So now this is the group data. And because we removed the outcome before, I've got to rejoin the outcome column here, which I do just with this uh, assignment on the data frame. And that returns the group data. And that's basically the end of this uh, little code section. Um, we've run the dimension reduction transformer. And now I'm actually going to save out that data. Um, and I'm also going to save my transformer here too. Um, and these should all go out to that same path where I've been saving everything. Let's see. I'll just let this run out and I'll show you in my local directory. Okay, here's the transformer that I just saved. Uh, it's just a pickle file, binary file, seven kilobytes, not much to it. That was the one for the dimension reduction. And this is the one, no, that is the one for the dimension reduction. And this is the one for the, the scoring what I call the extreme data transformation. So, ooh, wow, you see that flicker? I think you can see that in the video. That's my computer freaking out, and I've been dealing with this the whole time. Well, anyway, thank you for sticking with me. I hope the stream is still intelligible and you're, you're seeing and hearing everything okay, despite my computer freaking like that. Mm. Very disappointing, very disappointing. All right, let's go on to something new. I'm finally gonna do the new coding segment uh, which I'm I've been building up to so far. So today, the really new material is to talk about transformer pipelines. Um, so in this case, I've just, in both the past examples, I've been showing you that I fit a transformer and then immediately transform the same data which is not really that useful. Uh, it's more useful to actually use your transformer on new data. Or, I mean, that's like the whole thing about them, that you can use them on new data um, to when you have a validation set or if you're gonna do out of sample forecasting. So now let's actually look at a high level at the data preparation process. And this is kind of out of the book. This is the data processing pipeline for regression that I teach in the book. Um, you basically export your data set. We didn't even look at that today, but these are all the steps that I showed in the book. You make a summary of the data set, which I showed in this listing 5.2 earlier, and I save out a statistics table. Then you use that in scoring, um, which saves out uh, the parameters of the scoring. Now in the new version, I've actually replaced this with saving a transformer that did the scoring. Um, and you also create the score data set by doing that. Now then you run this group finding algorithm um, and that produces the loading matrix. Um, and in the book code, I taught that you just save out the loading matrix and then you use it in an apply groups function. And this gives you the group data set. Um, Sorry there, just cleared my throat for a second. But so this shows you the full algorithm um, that you use to prepare data for aggression in the book. And what I'm gonna do now is actually replace this by using my transformers. Well, we can look at that code. I mean, I'll, I'll show you real quick this listing, 8.1, which is uh, preparing all that data. Let's see. Here's the algorithm. I actually just have it saved in these five uh, function calls. Calculating stats. Um, why do we actually do that? Well, this makes sure that you've done it for a data set. You do the scores, you find the metric groups, um, apply metric groups, and then you do, um, well, this ordered correlation matrix is an extra step to produce the correlation matrix, like the one that I showed you earlier. Um, where the group metrics are shown next to each other. So this was the old listing that I had to basically implement a data transformation pipeline that would leave the data ready. And the thing about these methods, like the scoring method and the grouping method, is that they load the, the, the previous result the CSV file or the loading matrix. Like, I mean, th and that's how this function works. 
I can do I won't run it. I'll just kind of show you what happens here. This one has to load in the loading matrix and then um, you know, lo convert it to an ND array and apply that matrix multiplication, right? Um, and this function that does the scoring, the old version that I had would read in the stats file that you saved in a previous step. So my old version of this relied on reloading, um, as I show in the slide, multiple artifacts um, that were just saved. The stats, um, the parameters of the scoring, which is like which which metrics get uh, the skew transform, the log transform, and also the loading matrix. So these are all the steps, and basically what I'm going to do now is replace that with a transformer pipeline, which I've never done before. This is going to be some new coding for me, some new data science learning. Um, that's kind of how I keep my stream fresh for myself this uh, fall and summer and fall is doing new stuff that I've never done before. So, not really an expert on this, but figuring it out, kind of like everyone out there. So, sklearn defines an object called a pipeline. We were talking about transformer pipelines, and I was just about to attempt to code my first transformer pipeline when I was so rudely interrupted by my computer crashing. But I am stubborn and I do not take a hint. If the, if the universe is trying to tell me not to stream, I am not taking the hint. This is what I was about to stream and I am getting back in the saddle and doing it. <laughs> so we're talking about a transformer pipeline. And what you do in a transformer pipeline is you, well, you basically um, re, you just load the different stages in your transformer into um, this pipeline uh, as shown here, just by labeling them like with a string. And here I'm just showing a constructor. And then you create a pipeline and then you just pass the data into the pipeline. So that was what I was going to attempt to code when I was so rudely interrupted by my computer completely crashing. So hopefully I'll have better luck this time. I'm starting up uh, PyCharm again. Hopefully that's not what, what was causing my computer to crash. So, let's see. This is the listing which actually prepares some data for the first time. And it's not exactly the listing that I want to work on. Going back to this, what I want to do now is go to the use case where I have some new data and I already have my transformers. Um, and I think this is really it. This is the old listing that I had where I show how you can basically re-prepare some new data. Or maybe it's this one, this is a better example. Okay. So this is, was my old, basically, code pipeline for if you have some new data. The assumption here is you have some new data. Um, let's see, where is the entry point in this? Must be up here, okay, rescore metrics. Um, and in this case, this shows how I would have done it to basically re-transform a bunch of data. Actually, let's try running through this one. Um, so this is listing... I think I'm just going to duplicate this one. Uh, I'm going to go up and edit the configurations. 
just gonna duplicate this one. I'm gonna call this rescore no transformer. And it was gonna be chapter eight listing six, I think, or what was it, four? Shoot, now I already forgot. Yeah, eight four, rescore metrics. All right, let's let's watch how this one goes, and then I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically recode this algorithm using the transformer pipeline pattern. So let's just see. So what happens here is I have to reload the loading matrix. Um, let's see the data set path. I want to make sure this is the right data. Yeah, it's data set version two is kind of the one that I keep working on. Um, so you load the loading matrix. You also load uh, the score parameters, which is like the means and the standard deviations of the transform data. And then lastly, you reload the current data, which is the current data for the customers. This is like an out of sample segmentation exercise um, and then you have to go through the steps of, of using of actually calling all the insides of the pipe the data pipeline this is like doing the SKU transform that we saw earlier and all these transforms are called directly okay and then this is actually redoing the grouping using the loading matrix uh, the loading matrix, which we already saw. Right? <clears throat> this is the same loading matrix, but it was, it's not actually the transformer version. So this is like the new version. This is basically this a whole algorithm which redoes the grouping and scoring. And what I'm going to try to do now is do a retransform instead of doing all this like loading and uh, calling the old code. We're going to make a lot cleaner version than this. That's like the whole point of today's exercise. So let me close up these. I won't really need that. Um, so I need my metric group transformer. And I'm going to make a new listing, which is basically going to be the new version of rescore metrics, right? It's going to be retransform metrics using the transformer. And it'll be listing, I'm up to eight, uh, seven. I'll be, it's like an extra listing for chapter eight. So. It's going to be listing eight seven re transform metrics, I guess, or I can just call it like re transform. Uh, whatever. And I'm going to delete like everything basically. Um, this has to be re transform metrics actually I might save a little bit of something I'm gonna delete all this code because stripping it down to the part the things we actually need so now I actually need to import my old transformers I need to import uh, listing whoops this one Stream score transformer. Whoop! Damn it. <laughs> Sorry, deleting too much. All right, and from fight churn dot listings dot chapter six, I'm gonna import my wait a minute, wait a minute metric group transformer. Actually, I want to actually just import these, so I'm doing this wrong, but that's okay. Oh, here, I know what I want to do. 
import, I want to actually import the transformers themselves. Let me go to listing 66 and look at what the object name is. It's hierarchical cluster dim reducer. Is actually what my transformer is. I'm actually not even sure I need these imports now that I think about it, because I'm going to load the objects from pickles. Let's see, uh, rescore metrics, I don't need that. What I need now is the metric group, oh no, I needed my, my extreme scorer. That was my other transformer. Again, I'm not actually sore. I need to even import I'm these let you in on a little secret. because Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. Um, because I'm going to reload them from pickles, and then technically I won't even need the definitions. So let's think about it. Um, I do need that reload churn data method, so I need to import that from somewhere. Where do I import this from? Oh, this was a helper function. Okay, so I can import that from my old one. This was in... Uh, Rescore metrics 84. Like Let's just reload that. From fight churn dot listings chapter 8. It's going to be port reload. Okay, so here's my reload churn data. That's the one thing I actually need. Now the other thing I've got to do is reload my pickles. Um, and in here I'm always using this trick of replacing the uh, CSV suffix with the suffix that I actually want. So here what I want, um, I want my my scorer with data set path replace CSV. It's actually with a pickle. Um, so instead of data set two, uh, let's see, it's going to be this pickle. It's going to be extreme transformer. My brilliant name. This is going to be underscore extreme transformer, okay, and and I'm also going to make a reducer uh, scorer. This is actually scorer path reducer path, and I'm going to do a similar trick. I don't know if you can hear the neighbor's dog barking in the background. Streaming at home. So here I'm going to use this. Uh, this is the transformer I want to re reload, which I called HC Dim Reduce Transform. Not a very great name, I don't know. This is supposed to be like that. So this is going to be me reloading my two old transformers. Now, like I said, I'm not actually sure I need these imports. Um, what I do need is from sklearn pipeline import pipeline and that was from my code example that I was using to start um, K okay. right now what I need to do is this is the well I can just call it transformer pipeline equals pipeline and now let me look at that signature again basically I need to put in tuples of my objects and the name so I'll say score and oh actually I need to load let's see from pickle import uh, load let's just try that Although I didn't actually save these with pickle, it's a little bit confusing. I saw an example 
which told me to save these with joblib. I don't know if I have to like, does joblib have a load? Import joblib, maybe I should be using that. Can I do that? From joblib import, you all, yeah, you also have a load. Yeah, I guess I'll just use that. Cause that's how I saved it. Um, well, let's see, I'll just say scorer equals load scorer path. Whoa, <laughs> bad spelling there. Scorer, <laughs> jeez. How's everyone doing out there? Kind of getting my groove back now that I have the mellow music playing. Uh, and I recovered from my computer crashing, which was always miserable on the stream. I think it's only happened to me like one or two other times, and I don't know what caused it this time. So now, reducer is going to be load reducer path. So, this will be uh, if these are right. Score. We'll say this is reduce. Reducer. Okay, so there's my pipeline. Uh, where was the data that I loaded? Okay, here we go. Now here's the data. And I'll just say group score data. This should be super simple now. Way simpler than the last uh, version of this. It should be transformer pipeline dot transform. Uh, current data and that should really be it um, so this is a lot cleaner code for retransforming data than you got with the, the, the previous version I will want to um, save the data again so let me just what did I do in this for I'm just gonna copy paste from my old version because I still currently want to save it um, let's see How do I save the data in this one? Hmm. Yeah, I basically have to, I save it as this current group score, I guess. Yeah, this was pretty much what I did in the in the, the last version. So I'm just gonna kinda like redo this simple save out in my new version. And so that should be it. I mean, this should really be all it takes to retransform um, a new set of data using transformers. So it's a lot more compact. In fact, I can even just put this on one line because it's like so short. Although I seem to have a bug there. Um, and I probably need to pass these in a list. I'm just guessing. Oops, I don't need that extra parentheses. Okay. <clears throat> so that should be it. Uh, let's just look at that signature again. Yeah, you pass in a list. Um, well, I didn't look at that uh, code, but that uh, web page, but I, I looked at it previously. So I'm gonna try to, I should actually probably put in some checks. The last thing I should do is check that these paths are good. Getting a little lazy here. Um, do I have any asserts? Mm, these are kind of checking the data. Well, why, maybe I should just try running this. So to run this, I need um, a new, listing configuration in the configuration here. So this was going to be a listing seven in chapter eight, which is the transformer version of rescoring metrics. So I need a name for every configuration. 
And I don't even, I don't think I need any parameters. The default is this data set path, which is the one thing that I do need. So this should actually be all I need. Now to test it, I'll make a new configuration. Rescore with transformer. Now this has to be chapter eight, listing seven. And that should be all I need to get debugging this code. All right, should I try it out? This will be my first transformer pipeline. Um, yeah, a lot less imports here, and a lot less code, because now the code to retransform is embedded in the pipelines. Uh-oh. Immediately a bug. What's my first bug? Exception, what's it saying here? Run turn listing back cry. It's saying load and check listing params. Ah, uh, come on, what's my mistake? It's that key error, params. Hmm. Alright, I probably did something in this retransform metrics. Data set path. Oh, I know. I know what it is. It's in my configuration. Let's go back to that JSON file. Whoops, I closed it up too fast. Thought I was good, but I wasn't, because every listing, I think, needs a parameter. Every configuration needs a parameter. That's kind of like my mistake. I could, I could make that code better so that it doesn't need an empty parameter entry, but so it goes. All right, that wasn't too hard. Let's see if this works. All right, it's running the listing. Oh, okay, I made it to my first breakpoint. Now. My first step in the new version is just to reload my old transformers. And this replaces all that business about reloading the stats and the loading matrix and all that stuff. So let's try it. These are my paths. I'm just gonna kinda eyeball those paths, make sure they look right. And those look like the right paths. Let's try loading one. Ooh, it worked. Hey, and let's try loading this one. Oh, they both worked first time. This is good. It's looking up for me today. So now that I've reloaded those objects, what's interesting is that within the reducer, I actually have my loading matrix and all that stuff. Where is it actually? Should be in there. Oh no, this is not the one with the loading. Wait, this is the one with the... Uh, wait, I think I've got these names backwards. That's the problem. The scorer, hmm, this is definitely not gonna work. Okay, little bug here. I'm doing good. I, it's turning around for me, but still. This should be the reducer, <laughs> and this should be the scorer. Um, and I guess I should do them. I've got them like in the wrong order. I mean, you know, it's just to be logically consistent use them in the order that they're going to get used. So let's get to this next break point right here. All right, so now I have my scorer uh, and my reducer. And when I was gonna, I wanted to look at the reducer and see the loading matrix, but I didn't see it because, yeah, there it is. Uh, because I had was looking at the wrong object, and I noticed that I had them uh, the wrong way. So now this one has all the stuff about means and which are the 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 kurtosis threshold. And so now this is really it. So now I just create my pipeline. Now I'm reloading this current data. I didn't actually go into this, but this is a new data set of all the current customers. So I kind of divide between the historical training data. Now this is this, if you have actual brand new data that you want to use. So now I'm going to reload that data and we can see it should be a, a data set just like the others. Um, 
yeah so it's got for the index column the account id and the date and then these are all the metrics um yep all the metrics and now the moment of truth is to see whether calling the transform function on the pipeline object actually scores and reduces the data i'm just gonna cross my fingers here and see what happens oh it crashed i think something's not right What's happening? What did it say? It doesn't look right. I'm definitely crashing, but what happened? Console. Key error. Is churn not found in access? All right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of see. That's true, because this is current data. There's actually no column for the outcome. I think I could fix that actually by resetting it. So remember that I had in the transformer, um, I was there was handling of the outcome column. And in this case, because it's my current customer data, there is no outcome column. So let me go back to that listing. And actually, I think there's a simple fix, which is that I can change the behavior of my reducer and scorer. Um, scorer dot out call. This is a little bit of a hack, you know. I should, if this works, I'm going to do a proper function for it. What we'll have to do is we'll go and redo the transform. Let's first see if this works. Um, so what this is do is telling them that the data set that um, I, it's about to work on has no outcome column. So that's kind of like a key thing. Let's try this. I should actually put a breakpoint in my, um, hey, did that work? It's not running. What I should also do is go back and put a breakpoint like here. Let's just first make sure this works. So the, the scorer actually has a member called outcall. And here I'm basically just going to set it to none. Um, and that should change the behavior when I actually reuse the transform. And the same thing for the reducer. It had this column. Let's close this up. Reducer has a column also for the outcome. And I'm also going to just like none that, null that one out. <laughs> so I'm kind of cheating. I'm just going like into my object and changing the members because I know what they are, which is totally wrong. Totally bad object oriented programming. Um, but I'm going to make sure this works, and then I'll go in and make a more proper way to do it. So now, once again, I'm going to cross my fingers and see if this uh, application of the pipeline works. Here goes. Oh, now it actually hit my breakpoint. I think it's working. I'm inside it. I'm inside the... Uh, where am I? I'm in the, must be the score transformer. Yeah, the score transformer. At the last place I had a breakpoint. I'm gonna step out of this. Yeah, see now I'm in this, now I'm actually in the transformer, in this loop of transforming. I'm gonna keep running now. Now I'm actually in my reducer transformer, right? Yeah, at the last breakpoint that I had set. Um, anyway, let me just get out of here. I'm gonna step up, step up. All right, and that was my transform call. Hey, I think it actually worked. What do you say? I think it worked. Mm. God damn, Jimmy.
This some serious gourmet shit. Me and Vincent would have been satisfied with some freeze-dried tasteless joints, right? <laughs> Niece brings this serious gourmet shit on. Mm, good coffee, huh? Do I have any coffee left here? Mm, nope. Oh well. Anyway, it actually looked like it worked now. So that's what I'm seeing here. My new data set has groups for metrics, these group metrics, and everything looks like it was also transformed to scores. So that, this is actually working uh, with just one little bug fix. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna let this run, and now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna change. I'm realizing now that I need a new feature in my transformers. Uh, kind of custom Trent feature, which is to change the outcome column with a. I want to just make a more proper way to do it, so because this is kind of messy code, uh, bad object-oriented programming. So what I want in here is a just a simple function, like a modifier. Uh, def. Hmm. So I just want to do set out call self new call. I could actually say reset out call. And so here I'll just say self dot out call equals none. And so in this case, you pretty much have to. Uh, you'll have to reset it back if you want to use the same transformer again. Um, but I'll actually return it. Here, that's old call equals call equals self dot out call. Now I can return the old column. So that's if you want to ever keep track of what it used to be. Like if you want to set it to none and then change it back, that's how you would do it. Okay. So this was in my score transformer, and I'm going to go to my metric group transformer. Wait, is this it? And in the, the dimension reducer, I'm going to add this also. Yeah, okay, I think this is good. And so then in my final one, I'm just going to have a cleaner version where I'm going to say scorer it's just going to be reset out call. And in this case, I'm not going to save the old outcome column um, because I don't really care. In this particular code listing, I'm not going to reuse the transformer for data where I need the outcome column. I don't want you to tell me how fucking good my coffee is, okay? I'm the one who buys it. I know how good it is. <laughs> Who here remembers uh, Pulp Fiction? You know, the movie that that was fun from. It's pretty old now. Mm. Yep, I remember Pulp Fiction. All right, so what I've got to do, I've got to re... I'm going to quickly rerun my code, which actually created um, the Transformer. Because I need to... I need to make new versions that have this method because I added a method to it and it won't be part of the pickle. So I'm just going to quickly rerun the Extreme Store Transformer. And now I'm going to rerun Metric Group Transformer quickly. And that should have made the new versions that have my reset the column function. And now. Uh, I can probably close that. Now if I go back to this one, the retransform guy. Let's see, rescore with transformer. Now I'll see if that worked. All right. So now I load the scorer. I'll just try stepping into this method. Yep. Yep, so this is doing my old, yeah, basically resetting it to none. So that worked just fine. And same thing. So that's just cleaner than going into it and changing it. And it also would give you that option to save it, you know, save it out, and reset it back if, if necessary. So yeah, I think that is my um, transformer pipeline.
Well, that's one small accomplishment, even after um, my whole stream, my computer crashing and my stream crashing and everyone who was watching going <laughs> disappearing to watch something else. Uh, at least I got this code working. So, what else am I going to do today? Now, there's one more part of this transformation, which is actually to um, simultaneously um, re-transform and then run an algorithm. So this is actually the last thing that I wanted to try. This is a pipeline where I just normalize and reduce the data, and then I just uh, save the transformation. Oh, hey, Koroshama. I'm using PyCharm. That was PyCharm back here. I don't know. I like PyCharm. And I like supporting independent software companies so that we don't get all of our software from the same old five companies. So one of the reasons I stick with IntelliJ. So let's see. So the last thing I was going to do is I wanted to try doing, so I did this, transformer pipeline for rescoring. Now that you can also do a model pipeline, and that is the next thing I want to try doing, uh, which is in this case, I don't just do like normalizing and reducing. I go straight to modeling um, and calling like a regression algorithm. Uh, or it could be any algorithm, but in this case, I'm going to use regression because the whole point of this pipeline is to actually make the data well prepared for uh, running a regression. So let's look at my old version, which was listing 8.2. Because I'm going to have to like uh, steal some code out of that, as usual, to make my new listing. Let's see, 8.2. So this is my logistic regression code here. Um, I think this should be doing it. I mean, this is basically the regression up here. I create it and then you call the, the fit model. This is actually how I... Um, and so I already have a regression object saved, though so maybe I should run this just to like make sure. Uh, so I want to basically save a regression in a pickle, which I've probably already done. Um, although in a way I'd like to just start with raw data and pass it into the transformer. Well, let's start with something easier, which is just reusing the same, the saved logistic regression. So, so this was called rescore with transformer. I'm going to make a new listing, which will be eight eight. I want to try doing. I want to try a modeling pipeline. Um. I'm going to call this transform forecast because I wanted to see how this transformer and combined forecasting works. Although I might want to also do a trans combination of transforming and fitting. But let's just try something easier first. So in this case, I'm going to have to load my scorer and my reducer again. Um, and now I also need to um, reload my, my, my logistic regression, which I should also have saved in a pickle previously. I'm just going to like look down here. Uh, data set 2, yeah, so here we go, log reg model, it's basically just going to be like this, log reg underscore model pickle. See. So here I'll say model path equals let's see. This is supposed to be my new 88, so this is supposed to be transform forecast. 
forecast. Um, and here I'll just say model equals load model path. I think that's pretty much it. And now my pipeline, I'm gonna call it a model pipeline because it's gonna include a model at the end. model pipeline um, and lastly it, sh it should have a logistic regression you hear my dog in the background I don't know how he comes out on this microphone hopefully not too loud this is going to be the model maybe I should call this like log reg it's more clear we can also call this the log reg path. I'm just kind of doing better naming. All right, that's a little bit more clear. Ooh, but this is the wrong path. This will be, uh, like I just said, log reg underscore model dot pickle. And let's see. Oh my God, my dog is killing me in the background. Let's see, so now, okay, this is my data, and this is going to be actually my forecasts. It's not a model pipeline, what do I call now? Let me go back to that signature here. I just call it, oh, pipeline.fit. I think I want pipeline.predict, actually. Pipeline.predict. Or even better, uh, predict proba. That's actually my favorite. Because this will actually give us the probabilities of churn for everyone. And let's see. I want to save those forecasts. So this is a replacement for the old listing here, churn forecast, um, where I had to load previously scored data was actually the problem with this version. Um, and so here I'm actually just going to basically just do copy what I did in the old one, but except I'm doing the data transformation all in once. Here, I'll just rename this one to predictions. current data is the index. All right, I'll have to import pandas now. All right, I think this might actually work and do use my pipeline. Um, yeah, and the, again, the advantage of doing all this this way is that I can transform and do my forecasting without, uh, without having separate steps to retransform the data. So let's try this out. Just like before, I'm going to have to make a configuration for my new listing eight. This time I'll remember to include an empty parameter set. And this is a transform forecast. Um, yeah, and the only parameter will be the data set. So once again, I'll make a new configuration form plus forecast uh, okay so let's get back to that new listing and see how I did all right I got a breakpoint right, let's see how it goes let's give this a shot All right. 
way. I am in the right code. I am reloading the scorer. Changing that output column. Reloading the reducer. Now let's see about reloading the logistic regression. Hmm. Did that work? Yeah, it looks like it worked. Yep, that's my logistic regression from before. Now, the moment of truth will be running the pipeline. Um, reload the current data. So again, this is a data set that's not transformed into scores or groups like it's supposed to be. But now all that transformation should happen within my pipeline. Okay, the moment of truth. Crossing my fingers again, where I call predict Praba on my pipeline. Yeah, wow, it seemed to work really fast too. Let's look at the predictions and see if it looks like the output of predict Praba. Hey, I think it does. Indeed, those look like the outputs of predict Praba. So there you go. So that's really it. The rest of this is just saving. Now I save it in a data frame uh, and save those out. So this is actually kind of cool what I've just done, uh, I think, because I've never I had never done it before using these sklearn transformer classes. I basically saved my transformers, and so then instead of having to uh, separately re-prepare the data using, uh, well, I showed you previously I had an old listing where I had to call a bunch of, you know, I had to import a bunch of things and call directly the functions in the original transformation code. But in my new version, um, I just load the old transformers and put them in a pipeline. And this way I can do all the scoring uh, and dimension reduction and then prediction in one go. So yeah, I think this kind of um, achieves the goal for now. I know there are more advanced uses of uh, pipelines where you can actually fit the pipeline and fit your model in one go. But yeah, I think this is good for now. I'm going on two hours, which is plenty of streaming for me. So this was it. I We looked a little bit at logistic regression. Um, Although I just really ended up loading my old logistic regression and then I did a transformer model pipeline, uh, which was cool, I think. Summary, okay. Summarizing what I did in the stream today. Fighting churn is about targeted interventions like improving your product, engaging with your customers, or giving them support. Metrics summarize customers, events, and subscriptions, and we looked a little bit at metrics, though we were kind of just looking at them in aggregate. A transformer is an object that encapsulates a data pipeline operation, um, like scoring, so which is rescaling metrics to a more convenient scale. And then there's also dimension reduction, uh, which in our case, we reduce the dimension by merging correlated metrics. Now, a pipeline is the combination of transformers and possibly even a model. And I looked at that in the end of the stream today, too. Next stream, I'm going to do, I think, start a new subject, which is going to be doing analysis on Manning's live project uh, data, live book analysis. Sounds complicated, but there's a data set called the live book data set, and it's now a project that you can download and analyze. Uh, on from my publisher. So here, let's give a, uh, this is what it is. I'll show you. This is a new churn analysis project, which you can use for your own education and practice on data set, on a real data set. So uh, live project is Manning's online project library, which you can do on the project. So you learn on a project with real data. Now this uh, is a churn fighting live project where you actually analyze Manning's live book data set. So here I can 
to show you this. Let's try this link. See if this crashes my computer. Since my computer has been like such a dog today. Let's see. Hmm. There we go. Finally, it has come up, and I can show you. This is Fighting Churn with Manning's live book data. Um, so it's a three-project series from the my publisher Manning, where you can actually practice. Uh, and well, it's showing you the price here. Next stream, I'm gonna have a discount code for this. So if you're holding off, keep holding off. Um, and you can get a discount code. So there's three different projects, each which cover a different phase of the churn analysis. Oh yeah, and there's me, project author. Yeah, well, let's not look at my, me. You've seen me right here. So anyway, in my next stream, I'm actually gonna show you what's inside this project. I hope that will be kind of fun and interesting. All right. Well, I'm going to call today. My usual live streaming schedule is to stream on Saturday, usually starting at 2 Pacific, which is my local time. It's kind of just convenient time in the middle afternoon for me. I know more people are streaming and stuff during the week and in the evening, but you know, I got a busy life and this is about the only time when I can squeeze in an uninterrupted block for streaming. So just got to go for it when I have a chance. Um, also, I will upload these videos onto YouTube. I've got a channel there. If, if you're wondering where to find these when you're not on Twitch or if, I don't know, if you have friends who are on YouTube, you can check it out there too. Uh, and lastly, here's the book, Fighting Term with Data, kind of the basis where all this comes from. So you can, if you want the book, definitely use the discount code, you know. Am I still pointing the right way? Oh yeah, it's the backwards pointing on camera. <laughs> and so yeah, that's it. Please follow me on Twitter, give you the updates on when I'm streaming, what's going on. So yeah. So it's kind of a hard stream for me today. I thought I was doing good with my new mic until the, the weird crashing stuff started and then I completely crashed, had to restart. But Thank you for everyone who came back to watch this. Hope you find the Transformer Pipeline interesting. I'm gonna call it a day. Next stream will be live project time. I should be back next weekend to work on the, it'll be a new project, analyzing the live book data from Manning. So that's that. I'm out, gonna call it a day. Thank you.